Dora to kind of set the stage to start us off on this perspective of 21st century student uh, and a 21st century learner. She will talk about some of the things that adults can learn from kids. One of her powerful messages that I've heard her say and that strongly resonates with me is that when expectations are low, we will sink to them. In her remarks, Adora is speaking about kids, but this message applies to adults also. Adora is articulate, uh, high energy, fun, and a perfect spokesman for the youth of today. So as you listen to her, realize that although her abilities in public speaking are exceptional, her message is one that you would hear from every student if they had the nerve to stand before you. My point is that not all youth may have the skills, ability, or comfort level present, uh, presenting as Adora has, but if they did, they would all want you to hear the same message. So as we move forward, as we work in our buildings to build this new education system, we have to remember that we keep our expectations high. Our goal is to ensure that every student, not just some, but all students, graduate from high school and go on into the real world, and when they get there, they do not need remediation. And you, and not only, uh, and you, not only collectively, but individually, will play a key role in accomplishing this. We have set expectations for student voice and education, and I just want to start by saying how thrilled I am to be speaking to you. This is a tremendous honor for me. Um, I'm actually quite close in Washington State, um, but I've never been to Boise before, so this is really a treat. And I think that when I came here, I wasn't quite sure what to expect, and then I was really blown away by hearing the superintendent speak because everything really resonated with me, and I think that you'll hear a lot of those same messages probably reinforced in my speech. But I think that the biggest takeaway is, I want to go to school in Idaho. <laughs> so maybe I can convince my parents to move here. Now, I'm hoping that all of you are really awake at this hour in the morning. I have to admit that coming here, I was a little bit jet lagged. I actually flew in last night, and um, I came home straight from Cannes, France. Uh, so I went to the last day of school, got like your signatures, and hopped on the plane. So quite an interesting experience. Now, I was trying to think of sort of an analogy to develop as I was thinking about this conference and education. And I realized it was interesting, actually, the parallels between the conference that I was at in France and thinking about education. Um, the conference I attended in France was actually about a completely different topic, advertising. And it was all these ad agencies from around the world. And they focused on both the creative side, their storytelling, all these techniques they were using to attract customers and consumers to their brands. Now, an interesting thing that I noted was how skillfully they meshed this creative side, the storytelling, um, the artwork, the craft of filmmaking, and the science of analyzing data about their customers. So they looked at how are these people using Facebook? How are they on Twitter? How do they tell their friends or colleagues about products? You know, what are these trends? And uh, it was honestly a little creepy how much they knew about us. <laughs> but I looked at this and I thought, well, much like advertising, teaching is both an art and a science. So today I hope to provide both a teacher and a student's vision of the road forward as we're in the 21st century, which is pretty awesome. And I think that this is really a really awesome time to be both a student and a teacher because you can see how we're going, how we're sort of leaving behind the traditional blackboard and assignments that one person reads and we're going instead to this flipped classroom, to videos, to students doing authentic projects and students using personal devices for educational purpose. So this is a world that excites me tremendously. I think that all these things are the literal and metaphorical new kids on the block. Now before I delve into the topic, please let me just introduce myself a little bit more. So if you're wondering how I'm both a student and a teacher, I actually have a really interesting background for my education. Um, for one thing, I actually didn't go to school for 10 years. Now you're probably thinking, she didn't go to school? How is that possible? Well, uh, this is me when I was three years old. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I admit, I was a little bit eager to still, but still, look at me. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, I don't do that now. Um, when I was three years old, I was reading chapter books really avidly. I would actually pick up a book, and I would read and read and read. My mom would have to shout at me to come to dinner already. And I was, I guess, a little bit advanced. A lot of the three-year-olds, I think, weren't reading chapter books yet. So my parents thought, well, maybe... <laughs> 
I'm not sure there are some. Um, my parents thought, well, it might be a little bit of a waste to send her to preschool if she's going to like, learn her alphabet. So they decided that they would just hire some private tutors and we would learn at home. They didn't really think that this would go on for a while. But it ended up being quite long-lasting because it worked really well. We had some neighborhood kids join us, and it was this really fun after-school program for them and an awesome school for us. And then I also took classes at my school district's um, homeschooling resource center. So I had the chance to do a lot of creative writing at this time to develop my writing and reading skills um, in a really advanced way, I think. And I worked alongside kids who were a lot older than me. Actually, when I was three years old, I was taking classes with some seven and eight-year-olds, which was quite an experience. And I'm glad that I had this freedom at an early age because I saw that my friends, a lot of them who were in regular school, were doing a lot of worksheets and bubbling things in. And for a while I thought, wow, those are so cool. You get to do these worksheets and you get to color inside the lines all the time. And I thought that was really awesome. But then I realized, well, they're jealous of me because I get to write and write and write and do all these things that I find really fun. So it was definitely interesting for me to see that experience contrasted. Now our teachers were, um, often a lot of them were recent college graduates, and I think that one of the great things is that they were incredibly passionate about their subjects. So we learned about really crazy stuff about anatomy and modern dance and Mexican revolutionary history because it was really um, a fairly, I guess, free environment. Whatever our teachers were passionate about, we learned about. So while other kids were learning about George Washington, we got to learn about George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and Emiliano Zapasa, which was really fun for those of you who like Mexican revolutionary history. <laughs> There's nothing not to like. <laughs> now, I think that one of the awesome things, I heard something about, um, as um, Sal Khan was talking about, this whole connection between teachers and students in the Zoom video and the personal interaction. Well, in our case, we use technology pretty heavily. We all had laptops. We wrote on our laptops a lot. But I think that that actually helped us interact with our teachers more. And they were very close to us. A lot of times, actually, one of my tutors, Lisa, she would write with us and kind of go through the assignments with us, which was definitely pretty incredible and unique. And we wrote a lot every single day, whether it was to learn vocabulary words, we'd create stories around these new fantastical words we were learning, um, and we would write poems, all kinds of different things. As another example of sort of a weird creative thing that happened, we were learning about different forms of government and democracies, republics, dictatorships, all these different things. And what we did was we set up an imaginary country called Dinenoch, and it was a dictatorship we decided. Our teacher would be a dictator. <laughs> but what she perhaps didn't expect was that when she left the room really briefly to use the restroom, that we would lock her out, declare a revolution, and write manifesto. <laughs> I think that is an amazing way to learn about government. <laughs> and I think it was honestly one of the funnest things that uh, happened, although there were a lot of fun things going on. So there was really no like hard set curriculum because we were sort of at the center of this plan. And I think that it was interesting because if you fast forward a few years to where I am today, I'm in uh, regular school part time, I take some online classes as well. My sister is full time in public school. I definitely see a lot of differences because a lot of times students' differences, I feel like are, I mean, obviously you all know students are very different, but students' differences are not quite as important as what has to be covered in a given day. And so I'm really thrilled to see how you all are using data to really understand students, understand different levels, because I think that this has the tremendous potential for even in a really large class of 20 or 30 students to have that same individual learning that I was able to have when I was younger. So this is my educational experience now, online and regular school. And it's, this is an arrangement that works really well for me, except sometimes when I'm traveling, it can be a little bit difficult to mesh with my extracurriculars because I have slightly odd extracurriculars. Everyone else does swimming or dance or theater, but I do public speaking and teaching, which I would definitely not give up for the world. But although I've spent less hours sitting in school than many students, I've actually probably been to more classrooms than a lot of other students. I taught over, I think, 400 schools and classrooms around the world now, whether through video conferencing or actually being there in person. Now you might wonder how I got started on this path of teaching. Well, it actually started in a really unlikely place, with Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> how many of you have read Little House on the Prairie? I think the raise hands. Any guys read it? <laughs> seriously? Yeah! Um, no, what is, seriously, what is the deal? I think pioneers are cool, no matter, uh, but, so the point is, is that I was reading these books,
folks when I was much younger. Uh, wow, I want to be a pioneer just like Laura Ingalls Wilder. Now, living right near Seattle, there's not much further west you can go without falling into the future sound. So, I figured, well, instead of being that kind of pioneer, hmm, how else will I be like Laura? Maybe I can be a teacher. Because in the last book of the series, Laura Ingalls Wilder, this teenage girl, actually goes and teaches in this one room schoolhouse, this country school. So, I found something extremely romantic about this idea of teaching as I saw it portrayed up and around the blackboard and uh, really lecturing the class. And if some, someone did something wrong, you could rock them on the hand with a ruler. I really like that part. <laughs> you know, can emphasize. However, I saw teaching represented in these books, I realized later on that this was a somewhat strange career choice at seven years of age because young people don't tend toward teaching automatically or culturally, I think. Actually, I'm, uh, my mom's Chinese, so I know a little bit. And Laosha, the word for Chinese, the word for teacher in Chinese literally means old master. So to be a young old master is a little bit incongruous. But I was really lucky that I had the opportunity to be exactly that a lot sooner than I had expected. With my love of writing, I was creating all these short stories. I would type them up on this old black Dell laptop that my mom had gotten uh, for me when I was six years old. I had immediately taken to writing. And after a while, I had amassed quite a collection of stories, but I wouldn't have seen them go somewhere. I think that when we produce work, whether we're students or teachers, whoever we are, we want to see it go somewhere beyond one person reading it. Even no matter how wonderful they are, we want to see bigger readership. So as a seven-year-old, I went to my mom and I was like, you know what, I really want to publish a book. Well, what would you do if a seven-year-old told you that? Would you say, wait until you're older, or that'll be really difficult, or go right ahead and do it? Well, my mom said the last one, and I'm definitely eternally grateful to her for that. She's sitting over there at table 47. <laughs> and, uh, as a seven-year-old, I didn't really expect anything different. I took this for granted that my parents would encourage me to do things like this. But when I started calling up publishers, sending out manuscripts, all this hard work, it might have hit me a little bit that, wow, getting published isn't that simple. But nevertheless, I think it was that naivete as a seven-year-old that allowed me to go so far because when we're kids, we don't quite realize how difficult something is. We do things impulsively quite a lot. If any of you have young children or have had children, you probably have seen that evidenced in good and bad ways. I think, though, that it can really be a positive trait. I spoke about that a little bit in my TED Talk, these traits of kids that can be quite positive. So all this impulsivity and naivete Bundled up in a one, and I went out, and after many, many phone calls, many sending out manuscripts, I was lucky enough to actually get my book published with Action Publishing, and I have um, three books now, Flying Fingers, Dancing Fingers, and Young in Disguise. So this story does have a happy ending, although it isn't over quite yet. So that's how I started my books. How did that go to teaching? Well, when I was that young, between the ages of five to seven, I think I didn't have the realization that there could be people out there who didn't like reading and writing. To me, a world where people didn't like reading and writing, it just had never occurred to me. So when someone said, oh, I don't like to read, I suppose that perfect image of this world where everyone likes to read and write was shattered. Now, being naive and being impulsive, I thought, what? I'm going to do something to change that. If this world that I've thought of doesn't exist, I'm going to make it. So again, you can see that sort of youthful, nice hit at work. And I decided that I would go around to school and make kids like reading and writing. Of course, if any of you are, have been language arts teachers, you might know that that is a little bit more of a difficult proposition than it seems like at first. But I learned a lot over the course of this journey about reading, writing, and teaching them, and especially student voice and technology in more recent years. Through this unique role as a teacher and student across many mediums, both online, through video conferencing, in person, in, as a student in a small home school and a large public school, I definitely had the chance to see that increasingly the diversity of our students, as you all have probably witnessed firsthand, and the wealth of information that we have accessible at our fingertips necessitates a really new model for school, some really new ideas for schools. And I'm really thrilled to see all of you in Idaho taking such an amazingly uh, forward-thinking stance on all this. Now, in the olden days, since I'm a lower history, I always have to go back to the olden days, you would see 
tutors like Aristotle teaching Alexander the Great, and customization for students happens quite naturally. <coughs> now, of course, it's not exactly realistic to say, okay, let's get an Aristotle for every single student, but I think that we can aspire to allow students to become Aristotles in, in the sense of asking questions, being able to look at the world through different lenses and have an impact. Creating this new idea of changing our schools really requires not only this forward thinkingness, if that's a word, which I doubt it is, but creativity at the very least, it's, it also demands an understanding of youth digital culture, where we as students are coming from, and how we use the internet, our sort of second home every day. It means meaningfully implementing data in the decision making, as we've heard over the course of today already. Now, over the past seven days of this can advertising conference, it was difficult, really almost impossible, to escape talk about how the world has changed. Which I think brings to mind a really interesting point, which is that in the 21st century, I feel like change is happening really rapidly. I'm sure that every generation has felt like that, but I see so many different things happening. New websites being introduced, Instagram being bought by Facebook, having more value than Kodak. I mean, that's definitely kind of an incredible testament to how the world has changed. You could see it at this advertising conference even in the new categories. They introduced cyber and digital, all these different other awards. <coughs> now many experts in these agencies realized that they had to transform from print marketing and a lot of the more traditional media to social networking, trying to get things to go viral. So advertisements are going to where their customers are online. What does all this have to do with education? Well, as I was watching this, I thought, how if advertisers are doing this, why can't educators? And I think that many educators already are doing this very effectively, going to where the students are, and using social media, using a lot of online tools to really connect with students more effectively. So as we envision schools, we also have to really look into students' lives. That sounds a little creepy, I apologize. Um, you know, the best of intentions, and see what are the sorts of things we're saying? What are we doing? What do we see when we go to social networking sites or go online? So. Let's start with a little bit of a pop quiz. FTW, I see this a lot. Actually, I've used this term a lot before as well. And you want to guess what it stands for? Raise your hand for the choices. A, feed the world. Okay, not too many hands raised. B, for the win. Okay, a few more hands raised. C, forget the word. A couple hands raised. Or D, finish the work. A lot of hands raised. You know, I think like half of you didn't actually even raise your hands at all. <laughs> <laughs> now you have some empathy for us. <laughs> um, no, actually, this is funny. As a quick side note, whenever I speak to teachers, the worst hands raisers. I'm sorry, but <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that since since students get way better at evading getting called on over time, maybe it just has developed even further. Anyhow, the correct answer, you guys actually are fairly tuned to students and social media because it is for the win, B. Now, if you, I think that was like the majority response, even with so many non-participants. Oh. <laughs> You'll see this everywhere. So, eating tacos at 1 a.m. FTW. Just random things, if you say something is for the win, it's, um, it's kind of difficult to describe actually, but it's, it's a positive thing. So, yeah, that's for the win. What about YOLO? This one is really all over the place. YOLO. Anyone want to define it? Yes. You only live once. Yay. You are a really young crowd. <laughs> in mine, in, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, that, that's impressive. I've actually asked a lot of teachers what YOLO means, and uh, so I'm really glad to see you know that. Great, so this is another one, it's used all over the place. Um, I, I think that there's actually considerable backlash against it now, so if you say YOLO, you will probably get one or two negative comments, but it's still used quite a lot. So that's FTW, YOLO. I think it's the new OMG and ROTFL, not because people aren't saying OMG and ROTFL anymore, but rather because YOLO and FTW have become so ubiquitous on social networks, it's almost impossible to ignore. And they spawn digital memes that you can see all over Facebook. How many of you have seen memes before? Just see it quick. Okay, I'm seeing some raised hands. Memes, but I'll show you a few examples of them. Let's see, do I have some memes? Okay, here's troll face. How many of you have seen that? Seeing some raised hands? Yay! You guys really are an interestingly young crowd. 
So the 12 face is just used everywhere. I still don't quite understand the justification between this really ugly face, but it's just uh, also the phrase trolling people everywhere. Um, at some point, I think, again, that backlash if you say too much, but uh, these are pretty inescapable. Now, when I told my mom about this, I was saying something about this really funny meme. I think it was the most interesting man in the world meme. And she said, memes? What are memes? Memes? <laughs> she just had never heard the phrase before. It was completely foreign to her, and I thought, okay, that is definitely evidence right there of the old digital divide thing. I think that the interesting thing with memes and these other really short, fast ways of consuming content is how quickly they spread. Someone will share it out, and then 50 more people will share it out, and it expands pretty exponentially from there. It's really funny. So, oops, um, thought I had some more examples of memes, but you'll see them. It's basically most memes are images with text over them, and they're repeated a lot. There's the most photogenic man in the world, or uh, sorry, all the photogenic man, there's the most interesting man in the world. There's all these different crazy images pulled from pop culture, whether it's advertisements or a singer's face or a really random photo, they can be anywhere. But what makes these memes funny is that they spread really quickly or that they're talking. So yeah, that's the really fast introduction of memes. You can spend a really long time studying them. Now, the fact that these things are instantly recognizable is also interesting. Um, I feel like it's kind of wiring to us now that we've seen so many of them, and the intersection of pop culture is quite interesting too. But another thing is that it's a way for us to create content. And whether we're looking at, sharing, or making Facebook memes, or we're watching YouTube videos and making them, or reading celebrities' tumblers and making our own, we aren't sitting back and waiting for grown-ups to tell us what to watch, what to make, what to read. So what's the lesson here for education? I think that we could think about it this way. What if we could make learning as viral as memes that spread around Facebook? Or we could use connections of the online world to bring schools and students closer. When you understand your audience, you can definitely approach them more effectively. And as I saw from you guys, you have fairly, your, your fingers are definitely on the pulse of my generation a lot more than um, I've seen in the past. So one thing to realize is that while social networking is definitely primarily about socializing and not education, there is a pretty significant portion of our time that we spend online actually devoted to education. Um, some of you might have seen Facebook groups that students set up devoted to classes that weren't. So for instance, for my classes are in high school, I have my APR history page, and we just post things like, when are we going to get our assignments back? What grades do you guys get on the tests? All these different things, biology, the same thing. I find it really interesting that when students go to Facebook, they don't immediately think, okay, I'm going here to chat, I'm going here to socialize. It could be, I'm going here to find out what my homework was yesterday. I'm going here to find out if my score on the test was so bad or if the teacher curved it at all. So it's, I think it also evidences that students are maybe a little more seriously minded than we're occasionally given credit for. But much as I love these groups, I find it to actually be a somewhat shallow use of the technology that we have at our fingertips with social networking. Because there's a huge possibility for online projects to give students like me more purpose in what we learn. Too often I hear students saying, why are we learning this? This is boring. Or complaining about projects that are time consuming because they feel that there's only one person seeing it, that it's going to be graded, and then it's going into the wastebasket to never see the light of day again. And I can't entirely fault them for that, because a lot of times that is what happens, and the response isn't entirely unjustified. If you've done a whole lot of work, if you've been stressed out for two weeks over a really big project, and your boss sees it and says, good job, and nothing ever happens, you might feel a little bit nipped. So that's what happens to, I think, a lot of students uh, every week, every day. So. Um, just a thought about purpose. Now, on a more optimistic side, I've seen a lot of amazing examples of how students are using the internet and how teachers are giving students the chance to use the internet to have purpose in what they do. So, the ideal new school is one where all students feel purpose in their learning. And you can see this through contests. My friends Maya and Priya and I actually recently participated in something called the National Education Startup Challenge from the Department of Education uh, at the federal level. 
And it was really cool for us to actually think about our own education and think, what would we change? What kind of program might we introduce? So ours, we called Application for the Future, and our cheesy little rhyming slogan was, Bridge the Gap, Build an App. It was all about bringing technology to underprivileged schools or uh, rural or urban schools that didn't usually have the chance to experience technology firsthand. And we gave students the chance to learn coding and programming by making an app. So we made this little trailer video to submit for the contest. You can take a look. They said that I didn't have the technology skills I needed for the job. There, now there's oh. an app for that. Application for the future. This innovative new startup provides students in underserved school districts with the unique opportunity to build 21st century skills through designing an app. Working in teams of five with expert volunteer mentors from technology fields, students will refine their products to bring to a larger audience at the Consumer Electronics Show in January. Through the collaborative process, students will develop their teamwork and leadership skills, practice writing with clarity, and obtain valuable STEM skills, all in the context of a real-world assignment. Bridge the gap, build the gap. Application for the future! I still can't help but laugh because I don't know why I made a fist there. <laughs> <laughs> it was not intended to be militant in any way. <laughs> so, I guess when I saw this, Contest, I was really excited because for one thing the Department of Education was reaching out to students, which was definitely a huge step forward. I've always wondered, well, where are students in the whole education reform equation? I'm amazed to see that not only here students come first, but the students get to come. I think that that's really awesome um, to have students as part of the discussion. But the point with this was also that I felt like we had purpose. It was going somewhere. It was being seen by these officials. It was going up on the website. And I thought, wow, it would be cool if all of our assignments were like this, if all projects were like this, where we saw it having a purpose, where we got to really think deeply because we were working for an authentic audience. If school is supposed to be preparation for life, the life that I'm being prepared for is an awfully strange one that consists of crises that hand me multiple choice answer sheets, which I'm sure all of you have experienced in the past. So when we think about these different projects, giving students authentic purpose, we can also consider how do we give students the opportunity to make change, to do good for the world. A lot of times when I hear about people doing amazing things as adults, and we often seem to think that students or kids are kind of in this mode waiting to you know, go to college and then after that we can have an impact. I don't think it works like that. I think that we can really do a whole lot with the skills that we're learning right now. Making knowledge very useful and purposeful for us to actually go out and change the world, I think is the most motivating thing that um, anyone could do. So I see this as really the new project-based learning. The thing with project-based learning that I've noticed is that a lot of times there will be a really cool project, but again, it doesn't, have, it doesn't go out into the world. My sister once did this India map for her Honors for World History block, and she basically spent three hours putting tiny beads on a big clay shape that was supposed to resemble the nation. And a few months later, we actually went to India. Did she remember where the Indus River was, or the major cities, or any of those things that she had painstakingly placed beads on? She didn't. I thought, okay, if that's what's happening with project-based learning, it's really a shame. So that's just my two cents on project-based learning and really how an audience is so essential and crucial. Now I'm seeing how technology is being implemented in such meaningful ways in Idaho, whether it's with flipped classrooms or using data, and I am so optimistic seeing this. I think it's really incredible. Now as another example of how students are really kind of taking it to project-based learning 2.0 or really taking this whole thing of purpose and audience further, I organized an annual conference called TEDx Redmond. How many of you are familiar with the TED conference here? Yay! TED fans. Um, so TED stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. TEDx events are independently organized versions. So ours is entirely organized by youth for youth. All of our speakers are under the age of 20. We had some really awesome people, Jordan Romero, the youngest kid who climbed Mount Everest, um, lots of others. This year we have Taylor Wilson, who's a 17-year-old nuclear physicist. He got to meet Obama and has been doing some really cool things. When he was 14, he built a nuclear reactor in his basement, which makes him feel like an <laughs> underachiever and much safer to the public. <laughs> Really cool people are coming to speak. I'd love to invite all of you if you're willing to drive over to Washington State. I know it's a little bit of a drive, but it's a really awesome event. I promise it's worth it. So the point of this is that we're a group of kids getting together.
together in my house's basement and talked about a conference. But it's really more than that. Because for us, this has meaning, this has purpose, this has audience, we're working for something, and we're learning a tremendous amount of skills along the way. Believe me, there is no better way to learn how to write a persuasive essay than having to write emails to hundreds of potential sponsors trying to explain to them why they should give you money. <laughs> so, TEDx Redmond is, for me, uh, an incredibly inspirational experience, seeing also how seamlessly we're integrating all kinds of technology. Our committee of 20 teenagers really uses everything. We collaborate over Google Docs, PV Works Wikis, Google Plus, YouTube, Facebook. It's crucial to how we organize our talks, distribute um, information about the event, and connect with people both before, during, and after. I think that the TEDx Drummond event, the groups about learning on Facebook, some of these things that I've discussed that students are doing, maybe not the memes, but it all goes to show that students plus technology doesn't have to equal a name chatter, OMG, ROTFL, but that it can equal good for the world. When we get together in groups for TEDx Redmond or groups about education, we talk about important issues. We write well. We think seriously. I think that these are things that we can see in classrooms every day as well. Another way to give students purpose and allow us to help our world while learning is through teaching. So for those of you who have been in professional development sessions, you probably know a lot about what it's like to be a student as well as a teacher. And for me, teaching is an amazing way to learn. It forces me to think about things more deeply because not only am I memorizing it for the content, but I'm thinking, how do I convey this in an effective way? How do I ensure that students are engaged, that this is important to them, that it has an impact that they can really see so they are invested in it? I started my YouTube teaching channel quite a while ago. So now I have almost 900 subscribers, actually, which is pretty cool. And I posted, since I started actually doing video conferencing, I record every session, actually. My mom uh, is recording them and uploading them, which is very nice of her. And so far, I have like over 600 teaching videos, which are available for anyone to watch. No advertisements, which uh, I felt was important for the education purpose. And seeing these, I'm able to rewatch it and think, okay, how could I be better? Even though I hate hearing my voice on video, it's been a really effective way for me to improve my teaching practice, hopefully, and also for students to be able to find this afterwards. Every time I teach a new lesson to students via video conferencing, I'm thinking about all kinds of different questions that not only make me a better teacher, but I think make me a better learner. I see this as one of the best things about the ease of content creation for young people today. You've probably heard a lot of horror stories about what kids are doing online. We're posting terrible pictures of ourselves and um, making videos where we ask people to tell us if we're pretty or ugly and um, doing all kinds of really stupid things. Yes, that's true. But I feel like that whole negative, stupid side sometimes of being a teenager is tremendously outweighed by the fact that we're doing cool things like teaching. We're making videos where we ask people to submit ideas. We're holding contests. We're singing and uh, making videos about our art or science projects. In some of my writing videos, I've actually received tens of thousands of views, and occasionally people will comment saying things like, this was so helpful. To me, one comment like that outweighs maybe you know a few more views or something, so I'm really happy that um, I'm doing these education videos, even though I may not have quite reached the level of Rebecca Black. How many of you have seen Friday? <laughs> Okay, if you want to understand youth digital culture, I am amazed that you guys have seen Friday. It is a true masterpiece. Uh, yeah, that's maybe that's hyperbole, but um, I think that the point is, is that whether we're creating videos that receive hundreds of millions of dislikes, or we're creating education videos, that this ease of content creation allows us to have an authentic audience. So again, you're seeing that whether what we put out there is good or bad, we're really searching for people to be watching, to be commenting. And I'm not the only one uploading teaching videos online. Again, I'd like to reinforce what the superintendent said, which was really, I thought, a key message. I'm not exceptional. I am representing students who are exactly like me and who have things to say of equal value, maybe even more. And we have only talk about it here. So I'm pause this. So here's an example from Cameron Manor about teaching through this compelling video. And I'm sure that I really forced her. I've actually met her. She spoke at TEDx Redmond. Um, she's absolutely wonderful. And I think that I really forced her to think, OK, how am I going to make this engaging and funny and interesting for an audience that's young to learn about germs? And I feel like she did a really good job. So take a look.
students, not only because it's great for learning, but because we need to know where um, the next few decades teachers will come from. So I highly encourage you to um, get your students teaching and think about what is a topic I really care about, that I'm passionate about, that I would be interested in sharing with others. I'll show you a little bit of... I'd like to tell you how I wrote my books. It all started with national... Students are doing this, whether it's about writing, about science, there's a lot of awesome math videos at mathtrain.tv all by students. We're really taking teaching and learning into our own hands and a lot of examples with technology. I would love to see this being encouraged more inside of school as well, because a lot of what you've just seen is what students do on their weekend. They think, okay, this is something fun that I'll do to help others, um, but it's not really something that's happening in the class. Now, students like us can do a lot more than teach our fellow peers. We can also provide tech support in some ways. <laughs> Ask your students to tell you about what they see on Facebook. What is their life like, um, how, or I should say, how do they use the um, social networking computers to really shape their life? How do they see it affecting them? All these different things. Actually, at that advertising conference, it was really interesting hearing the president of MTV speak, and he said that at MTV, they actually have their young interns, so college age, mentor them, these high-level executives because they never want to forget their audience of young college students. Now, I'm not sure if the if Jersey Shore is perfect evidence for how that's going to be, or maybe it is as far as who's watching it, but I think that if you think about it as kind of a reverse mentor-mentee relationship, asking your students to really um, tell you about some of the things that they're seeing every day can be really fun and insightful. Many teachers and administrators who I've talked with can be a little bit hesitant to introduce new technology sometimes if they feel that they haven't completely worked out, worked it out, or understood it. But I think that this is not the correct approach to take because when it comes down to it, this is you can really play with it and you can ask your students to play with it as well to show you what they think would work well and um, really give some of their insights. It provides an important opportunity for students to really jump in and help. I was at a learning conference in Boston, actually, a couple of years ago, and one teacher said that at his school, some of his colleagues were so afraid of students getting near technology that they would put blue tape around things, blue tape around computers, blue tape around interactive whiteboard, and say, don't go into these blue tape zones. <laughs> and it's, it's sort of funny, but it's also a little bit tragic in a way, because I felt like these students were getting cheated out of the chance to see that the learning, the learning that technology represented could be in their ownership, in their control. So instead of setting up blue tape zones, whether metaphorically or literally, we need to open up. We need to ask students, what do you think? How would you use this if you were the teacher? We encourage students to get out there, create meaningful content instead of singing videos that maybe aren't so great, or I mean, of course, those too, but really meaningful content creation with an authentic audience and um, opening up opportunities for technology. Organizations like Generation Yes, Mouse Squad, and others give students the chance to provide that sort of tech support or to be in leadership roles in helping their teachers establish technology use. Now, of course, many teachers, maybe some of you, um, although you all are extremely progressive about technology, but many teachers probably remember the days of when VCRs were introduced and it was so new and uh, interactive whiteboards and blackboards and all these different things and how technology is continually kind of being updated and replaced. As a result, it might seem that a new approach, one with laptops in the classroom, is another passing fad. But I'd argue there's a considerable difference. So we saw devices like blackboards, TVs, VCRs being considered pretty innovative. But one thing that they have in common is that they were all primarily vehicles for delivery. You see something happen, you're watching it. But laptops, when used ideally, enable two-way conversation and consumption and creation, much like what we saw with the doctor who was splitting open the brain, which I would love to see. That would be awesome, as that I went to school in Idaho. Um, new slogan, Idaho, where you can see doctors dissect brains on uh, on recon. <laughs> so the thing that I see is this tremendous power of these laptops, and the reason that I'm so glad that you all are um, initiating this one-on-one -one program is that it enables very powerful um, two-way communication and for students to have that ownership, to have that power in our hands of really making things where we can produce learning content and utilize what we've learned in the classroom or in videos, if you're doing the flipped classroom model, we can put that to use in meaningful ways. On another note, I mentioned earlier that it's amazing to see students come first and also for students to come and be represented uh, that I have the chance to speak here, but I've seen in many other places that the student voice is typically left out. 
if you look at, for instance, NBC's Education Nation for the, last year, they actually just did the student voice panel, which I was really thrilled to see, but they hadn't had that before. And for some reason, a lot of times when this conversation about changing education is started, students aren't included in the equation despite the fact that we're the ones who are affected the most. We've heard from consultants, politicians, parents, all these different um, people, but one key voice that I think we need to include more if we can is that of the students. So I organized this thing called the Student Union on Facebook, which I would love to welcome all of you to join. And basically what we do is we try to fill that gap. We source all these different comments on how people go to school, what they see as effective, teachers that they really felt were using technology well, asking questions. So for instance, I mean, asked, what is a teacher? And Hannah had a really great answer. This is how I like to think of it. A teacher is somebody who is walking on a path seeking understanding. A student comes along and asks which way to go. The teacher points down the path and they walk together. A lot of people assume the teacher is already at the end of the road, but I like to think the road doesn't end. Nikhil said, they doubted, you believed, I succeeded. And over here, we ask questions more topically specific, so about history. And how do you think history, what, how is it being taught well, how could be done better? Hannah said that you could maybe include more different diverse viewpoints, including um, sources that, um, not cast American, maybe white, but I suppose that um, this may be a little less one sided <coughs> eliminating bias more, having a cross the globe interaction of some sort in school. I felt like these were really awesome points. Maya said to see history textbooks or history content as more stories instead of a series of facts being memorized for it to be taught more interactively. And Ethan about science said, let's get rid of boring lecture styles and use incredible experiments to demonstrate nearly everything. Which I thought was like, yeah, let's have, introduce danger all the time. <laughs> Actually, there's nothing that captures students' attention more. Um, Recently, uh, I saw the chemistry teacher at my high school it actually brought in like a giant flamethrower. I don't know how this works without setting fire to the whole thing, but it just threw, it was pretty crazy. But the thing that I noticed that was really powerful about that was that suddenly students were sitting up and they were staring and chemistry was cool, if only for a brief three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Introducing the metaphorical flamethrower, how can we do that with technology is a question that I've been asking as well. There were also some great answers around what is being done right in education. Students love that school is a place where you could go and really connect with peers, but they commented also that some of the most amazing learning they've done in school has not necessarily happened all the time in classrooms, but sometimes happened in conversations at, in hallways, in the time that is shortest. So there were some very interesting points I thought being made all around. Now some of these people, consider they say, oh, I'm a terrible writer. Actually, I think Ethan said that. And if you look at what he wrote, this is pretty, impressive for someone who calls himself a terrible writer. Um, all these people are creating posts that work really well, that are lengthy, that make sense, and are well thought out. They're not all exceptional uh, honor students or anything. There are a lot of people in the group who actually uh, are you know, doing general education classes or uh, have done remedial stuff as well. So we're really seeking that wide swath of students from all different areas. And the thing that I find really powerful is that we're starting a conversation which students have typically been left out of, this whole education reform discussion, and because of it, students, because of being included finally, I think students are really responding very well. So we post links, post resources for each other, and it's very authentic. All of these people who are responding, um, we, we make sure to keep it as students, and teachers and administrators are you know, watching, listening, and sharing resources role. Now, the same methods that I saw working really well here on the student union can work well in the classroom for reaching out to young people. We teenagers can be notorious as to how hard it is to reach us, particularly if you have any teenagers. As kids right now, I know my mom can complain a ton about me. Sometimes you've ever seen our eye rolls and stuff. But with the right tools and methods, it's fairly simple to reach us very effectively. As long as it comes across as authentic, caring, and fairly simple. Um, just take a look at the recent phenomenon of Invisible Children and Coney 2012. How many of you have heard of that? all the controversy and stuff generated. Okay, so they, Invisible Children, this nonprofit organization, made a video called Coney 2012 to bring awareness to uh, the warlord in Uganda who they were trying to depose. And it reached hundreds of millions of views because people were sharing it and clicking on it. And it really went viral immediately. I logged on Facebook that night and every single post in my newsfeed was about Coney 2012. It was a really crazy thing to see. 
And while that generated quite a bit of controversy, that organization, I think that it was a powerful example of how when students feel that they're being reached out and they reach out to and there's an issue they care about, we will take action, we will share, we will comment, we will campaign. Again, how do we make education, how do we make what we learn and how students think about learning as viral and as cool as um, this Coney 2012 video or any of the other ones that go viral? Yet despite this great possibility for connecting with us that lies in social networking and other online technologies and data, all these different things that we're seeing here listed as resources, I feel like when we walk into school, a lot of times we're expected to turn off, to put away our cell phones, put away computers, generally stay away from anything uh, with a screen, at least in my experience. Many schools take a highly restrictive approach to internet use. While I definitely can see the purpose of, say, blocking Facebook or blocking personal email as, as is the case in my school, I also feel that the approach can be a short-term one. Because students are going to go home and go to those exact websites probably anyway, and I prefer something called the touch the stove approach, which comes from an anecdote from my childhood. When I was two years old and a very troublesome child, I would always approach the stove and try to touch it. My mom was obviously a little disconcerted by this and it would always keep me away, but finally, because I kept on doing this, she turned to the lowest level and said, fine, go ahead and then touch it. So I touched it and I was like, okay, don't want to do that again. And uh, I didn't get burnt, but it was definitely an experience that taught me, okay, here's what you don't do. Now, the approach to technology use is let's block off the stove and students shall not venture near it at all, which I feel like is maybe a slightly counterproductive activity because if you have any teenagers in your home, you know that if something is forbidden, we will try to get our hands on it. And my parents were fine with my sister and me being on the internet at a young age. I actually had an email address when I was five years old. I would write letters to my grandmother, and it really improved my writing skills. But more importantly, it taught me, here's what you do and here's what you don't do online. I realized that I would need to take careful uh, practice my grammar and my, uh, not pronunciation, with my uh, grammar and form of what I was writing because people were seeing it. It was online. It was for the public or an audience or at least my grandmother. So that taught me, I guess, the rules of the road from an early age. However, my sister and I also made really stupid videos. We would, at like 11 p.m., start dancing and filming this on a webcam and putting it on YouTube because we were really bored during the summer and thought, okay, now of course, three years later, we're teenagers and our friends are digging this up and using it as humiliation and blackmail. The point being that we didn't really do anything super harmful. We just made really embarrassing videos. But now, as we have this experience of making thousands of videos private and telling our friends, don't you even dare look at that, we see, OK, this isn't something that we're going to do in the future. During spring break in college, we're not going to make way worse videos than the one on YouTube is, I guess, the thing that I'm saying. It's the touch the stone approach. So give students some freedom. Let us make mistakes. Let us fail. Be humiliated. It'll teach us a better lesson than this website is blocked. Another analogy that I've heard that I like, if you never teach a child to cross the street in childhood, they won't know how to do it when they turn 18. So again, that teaching us how to cross the street successfully and really learning what to do, what not to do, and having um, all the benefits that come with technology. So you are opening up an incredible new world with giving students laptops and I see a lot of amazing promise in it and really not too much to be scared of. That's what I see usually when my teachers are using technology that they're like, oh my goodness, is that advertising appropriate? One time when my art history teacher was searching for a video on YouTube. I don't know why, uh, I think this was not the non-education section. And the first video that popped up, we were learning about African traditional dances and it was someone's <coughs> native interior, which was you know, not generally what you want your high school students seeing. But the, the funny thing that I thought was that the media the interaction was like, oh, that's close, never going on YouTube again um, for a few days, anyway. And we don't need to be like that. I think that a lot of times students are mature, we can really figure out, okay, here's where we go, here's where we don't go. And again, this whole touch the stove approach, embrace mistakes, even when they're really hilarious or embarrassing. A great example of this really positive internet use comes from Esther Rojiki, a teacher at um, Palo Alto High School in California. She edits, uh, she teaches journalism and she also helps students edit their um, newspaper, the Pali Voice, and they have all these various publications. She said something very important to me, which I felt stuck, which was that she wasn't teaching students don't use the internet, don't go on websites, 
but rather to evaluate them as journalists, to find bias, to find misinformation, and really analyze that critically. These are skills that we don't need to teach just to our journalism students, but we can teach to all students. Ideas that I would love to see everywhere. In my own experience, having a blog from a young age was crucial for me to improve my writing and also for me to see that people care what I write and that what I say can have an impact. So allowing students to have blogs, whether it be private to a school or a classroom, is an amazing way to improve the peer-to-peer -peer connection, peer editing and feedback, as well as how students feel about their own writing. When I was five years old, not only did I have an email account, but I also was using the internet a lot for my learning. And I felt like it allowed me to develop my independence as a learner, to have more of that ownership over my learning. I would decide, here's when I want to go to the BBC Schools website. I played some really amazing games from our Egyptian history. There was one where you got to make a mummy, including taking out the brains and spreading salt all over. It was a fairly awesome game. It taught me a lot about history, obviously. Because I was able to find these resources for myself, really think, OK, what is effective? What works well for me as a learner? Do I like reading this article? Do I want to watch a video? Do I want to play an interactive game? What should I do now? I felt like I had more responsibility and that my parents trusted me more to, to, along, to I guess, manage my own learning. If a five-year-old could seek out resources and do these things, I'm sure that 15-year-olds could as well. We have the tools at our disposal. They're waiting and ready to go. You can tell that this new school idea that the schools that um, we basically changed or created through having a one-to-one -one program and other initiatives it isn't going to be a monolithic experience of walking into class and <laughs> of walking into class and saying, I'm going to sit down here and listen to the teacher lecture and this is going to be day in and day out. It'll be a patchwork of all kinds of things, of videos, of flipped classrooms, of project-based learning with authentic real-world purpose, of different audiences, whether they're online or in person. I think that that's an awesome thing. It gives us opportunities to create relationships with people, whether they're teachers, other classmates, friends, online and off in a learning community. I want to ask you a question. Looking at these three images, which of these images looks most like your typical average school view? A, B, C. Raise your hands for whichever. OK, so A, B, C. OK, pretty much everyone is unanimously C. The problem is, is that C isn't a school. It's an image of a hallway at the prison at Robben Island in South Africa, <laughs> where Nelson Mandela was in prison for 20 years, more than 20 years. And I feel like it's not just about looks. It really is not looks. But what I felt when I saw these contrasting images was that when schools feel like prisons to students more than they do uh, libraries or cathedrals, we have a problem. It really is about the ethos of the school more than what it looks like. But I also see a difference between the old school model and the new school model that fits this analogy. A prison imprisons people, and the old school model imprisons learning. Treating learning like it's only something that can be done seven hours a day within the walls of the classroom, on a blackboard, on a screen that students are watching, it just doesn't make sense. Now we have so many new sources of learning. We can learn from our peers. We can learn from those younger and older than us. We can learn from our teachers. We can learn from resources that we find online through independent learning. I understand the architectural limitations and reasons behind the current model that maybe looks a little bit prison-like, but I think that we can work to change the ethos of schools, where learning is treated as something to be restricted, that is limited within certain spaces. Creating lifelong learners starts with the understanding for students and for teachers that the world can be the best classroom of all. Teachers can come from all places and be of all ages. They can be like the wonderful tutors that I was privileged to have growing up who were just barely out of college. They can be young people like Eva Reidenhauer and Cameron Manor who have a webcam and internet access. They can be people like Sal Kant, whose inspirational video you just saw from 60 Minutes and his kantademy.org has over 3,100 teaching videos. So when I think of a vision for how schools should be different in the future, hopefully in the near future, since I'm going to be graduating uh, rather soon, I ask questions. What if instead of prisons, schools are more like libraries, in the sense of being open portals of knowledge, places where students could go and really find anything that they set their minds to find? Or more like cathedrals, not in a religious sense, but in inspiring students to learn with a purpose, to feel that there was importance 
in the knowledge that they were gaining. Realizing the power and potential of harnessing youth digital culture and informed data about students for educational purposes, the art and the science of teaching, I suppose, seeking students' perspectives on education issues. I would highly recommend asking your students, have a discussion. What do you see? What are problems? What are good things? What are bad things? You know, even incredibly simple questions, um, the types of things that we're asking on the student union. Ensuring everything that we learn has an authentic purpose and an authentic audience. These are steps that I feel we can all take to journey ahead on this road for the student of tomorrow. Because I only have two years in high school left, so I feel a certain sense of urgency. I wonder, where are the changes that will affect me? And if they won't affect me, I hope that they'll happen in time for young people like my baby cousins or your children, nieces, and nephews, and grandchildren who will be the students in the years to come. I feel like I'm incredibly privileged to be here today, not only because I'm speaking and I have the opportunity to share what I um, have seen with you, but also because I'll be going to sessions, learning a tremendous amount. It's very reciprocal. In many ways, my experience here, my experience at other education conferences could be a road forward. More reciprocal learning where teachers and students are truly learning from each other and where independent learning and um, networking technology is really part of the mix. I've been incredibly privileged to be here and to learn from all. I look forward to learning from all of you because I really believe that it is only when we know how to learn that we really know how to teach. Thank you so much.